If we want to go to heaven, we need a total transformation. We need it as individuals, and we need it as a church. And the time has come to speak about these things, because we are told that the straight testimony will cause the shaking. to have a total transformation. Well, this is uh, another strange title, right? I like strange titles. I hear the rumbling. I want to take you again through the history And then again, draw the parallels as we have been doing. After all, this is a typological series, isn't it? There was a good king and his name was Hezekiah. And he tried his very best to stem the tide of apostasy. And in the testimony about him, the Lord says in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah and wrought that which was good and right and truth before his God. Wouldn't mind having a testimony from God like that, would you? Wouldn't mind. But let's put it in the context of the time period. This is very close to the time of Jerusalem's fall. Very close to the time when Babylon would swamp that city. In 2 Kings chapter 18, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him amongst all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. Wow. (laughs) He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands of the Lord had given Moses. And the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. After all, the Bible says, you shall serve the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. So here came this mighty power. But the Lord protected him against this Assyrian king, Sennacherib. And he did what he could. He built the water tunnels, he fortified the city, he raised the towers, he made weapons, and he encouraged the people. That's a nice testimony. So Hezekiah did what he could within his sphere, and God added what he added in his sphere. So we mustn't sit back and say, well, you know, just let it happen. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers die in one night. It's arrogant king, blasphemes God, ridicules God's people. And Hezekiah's words, Be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. Isn't that a beautiful statement? If only we could believe it again. And not just read it. With him is arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested upon themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, pride and prayed and cried to heaven. That must have been a powerful combination. 
A king who believes and a prophet like Isaiah at the same time. And the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and the captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he turned with shame of face to his own land and when he was come into the house of his God that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with a sword. End of story. God intervenes. Ellen White writes that these kings had had every opportunity, but they slighted their opportunities. The rulers of Assyria, instead of using their unusual blessings for the benefit of mankind, became the scourge of many lands, merciless. No thought of God or their fellow men. They pursued their fixed policy of causing all nations to acknowledge the supremacy of the gods of Nineveh. Do we have a parallel today? Do we have a ruler like that who will acknowledge nothing? but his son deity, whom they exalted above the Most High. God had sent Jonah to them with a message of warning, and for a season they humbled themselves before the Lord of hosts and sought forgiveness. Francois has an interesting lecture on this, where in archaeology they find this one king who stops all warfare, and there's peace during his time, and he accepts the God. Of Israel. But soon they turned again to idol worship and to the conquest of the world. So the Lord exalts this king, Hezekiah, gives him everything, gives him uh, recognition by the nations around. Marvelous. And then what happened to him? The Bible says his heart was lifted up. So sometimes it's not so good if things go too good, well with us. And when he fell ill, the Lord healed him. And he let the sun go back 15 degrees and added 15 years to his life. Or was it 10 degrees? I think it was 10 degrees, wasn't it? What a terrible mistake. He was also foolish. And when the Babylonian ambassadors came to visit, Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, all the house of his armor, all that was found in his treasures, there was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Aren't we like that? Man, if those Babylonian delegates come, oh, we bow down to them. Wonderful to see you, Mr. Cardinal. We're so happy to be in your presence. I've been in meetings like that, so I know what I'm talking about. And what happens? The prophet Isaiah comes and rebukes him. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto king Hezekiah and said to him, What said these men, and from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? Oh, I showed them our tithing system now. I showed them how we worship and that we do this and that and the other and... uh, Wonderful, all these things that are in my house have they seen. There's nothing amongst my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, hear the words of the Lord. Behold, the day come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, nothing. It doesn't help to have these diplomatic relations with Babylon. You can be courteous, you can be friendly, you can be kind, but you cannot be yoked. And Hezekiah slept with his fathers and then his son Manasseh hmm, reigned in his stead. Now the Lord added 15 years to his life. Second Chronicles 33 verse 1, Manasseh was How old? Twelve, when he began to reign. So Hezekiah should have been dead for three years already when Manasseh was born. Is that right? So God wanted to spare the people of Israel, the children of Israel, a Manasseh. But by grace, he listened to Hezekiah And he didn't hold his foreknowledge against anyone, which is in the nature of God. I like that about God. And here Manasseh was born. 
the most evil king that ever reigned in Israel. Second Chronicles 33, but, that, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen. You know, once you start sharing with Babylon, then Babylon just floods into your system. It just happens. There's a typological warning there. Whom the Lord had caused, cast out before the children of Israel. He built again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. He read up the altars of Balaam, made groves, worshipped the host of heavens, built altars in the house of the Lord. Can you imagine that? Wow. He built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Here was full-blown idolatry. Where? In the house of the Lord. In the church. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Firewalks. He observed times, used enchantments, witchcraft, dealt with familiar spirits. I wonder whether he used neuro-linguistic programming. <laughs> he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. So here was full-blown idolatry in the church. And we read in the spirit of prophecy that the blood ran in the streets. He slaughtered God's people that opposed the idolatry. I wonder whether some of them were disfellowship. Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, 2 Kings 21, 16. One of the first to fall was Isaiah, who for over half a century had stood before Judah as the appointed messenger of Jehovah. <laughs> Others had mocking, scourging, Bonds, imprisonment, they were stoned, sawn asunder, tempted, slain with a sword, wandered in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, afflicted, tormented. Do you read something that sounds sort of like a parallel? Find them all over, these poor people. Some of them driven away. Isaiah. So, they say, in the traditions, was sawn in half by Manasseh. <laughs> so, if I see a King Manasseh in my church, I wouldn't be too fond of him. And I would condemn him, and I would say this evil man and all these things. But, the king of Assyria takes Manasseh captive. He puts hooks bronze hooks into his nose, you know, like you lead a pig, and pulls him along. I guess that nose was swollen like a watermelon. And he takes him and he chucks him in jail. And there he humbled himself before God, and God brought him back. And he tried to undo all the evil that it had done. But it was too late. But he'll be in heaven. So my point is this. We have Manassas in our church today. But let's pray for them. Because you might have to live with them eternally in heaven. Right? We have Manassas. I know we have them. 677 BC, Manasseh was carried into Babylon by the Assyrians. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people. But they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captain of the house of Assyria, which took Manasseh amongst the thorns, bound him with fetters, carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. There will be the Manassehs in our church who under affliction will humble themselves before God and repent of what they have done, even though there are droves sitting in caves and being driven from the flock of the Lord. Don't let a Manasseh rob you of eternal life. Don't let it happen. 
and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and he heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God, and there he did everything that was right. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from his fierceness of his great wrath because of the provocations that Manasseh had provoked from withal. It's easy to become apostate. It's not so easy to turn around and to do what is right. It's very hard. Once you're down that slippery slope, it's very hard to come back. The time was rapidly approaching when Jerusalem was to be utterly destroyed. And the inhabitants of the land carried captive to Babylon. They had to learn the lessons they had refused to learn under circumstances more favorable. Same will happen to us. Faithfully the prophets continued the warnings and the exhortations. Fearlessly they spoke to Manasseh and to his people. Is it wrong to warn the kings and the queens and God's people? Yes or no? We have to do it. But the message was scorned. Backsliding Judah would not heed. That's the way it is. Many had stumbled and fallen, never again to rise. It's sad. I've met many of them. And then Manasseh slept with his father, 2 King 21, was buried, and Ammon his son reigned in his stead. And he was 20 and 2 years old and began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem, and his mother was Meshuselamit, the daughter of whatever. <laughs> and he was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh did. So we had a good king and a bad king, and a good king and the bad king, and the servants of Ammon conspired against him and slew the king in his own house. So it didn't last too, la too long. And the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon, and the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. He was this little boy, grew up under the most horrendous circumstances, and he stood like a needle to a pole. So there are amazing things in these, these stories. Young King Josiah, because thy heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spoke against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that there should come a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I have also heard thee, says the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace. Conditional prophecy, did it happen to him? No, he died in war. Why? Because he wasn't listening. The Pharaoh came. There was this conflict between the Assyrians and the Babylonians. The Babylonians were rising. The Assyrians were opposing the rise of Babylon. Pharaoh came to help. And Josiah went to oppose him. Pharaoh and Necho. And the Pharaoh said, don't do this, leave me alone. I'm here on a mission with God. Don't come, do this. And Josiah said, I will. Why? Because they had this, hmm, this pact with Babylon. Because the Assyrians were their main enemy, they chose what they figured was the better party of the two, not realizing that that was the party that would flatten them in the end, right? You cannot choose between two of them and say, well, that's the better one. I'm not going to deal with Rome, but I will deal with the Protestants. Yeah, well, those Protestants could dance before the king and you could end up being a head on a plate. Isn't that possible? That's what the typology says. Don't choose one partner over another. So it didn't quite happen that way. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He was a good king. And he walked in the ways of David, his father. Was David his father? His grandfather. Great-grandfather. Great-great-grandfather. And he declined neither to the right nor to the left. And it's interesting that in his time there was a prophetess. I almost want to say it's like here at the end, just before the destruction, there's a little anti-typical... Adventist, with a prophetess with the name of Huldah. A young, 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 young movement in terms of prophecy. I'm not going to go there, I'm just throwing it out as a carrot. 
Because thine heart was tender and thou didst humble thyself before God when thou heardst the words against this place, because the scroll was read to him, and against the inhabitants, and rinsed thy clothes and wept before me, I have heard also, says the Lord, I have heard thee. I will gather thee to the fathers in peace. <laughs> Didn't happen. So Josiah's reforms raised the level of spirituality for some, so also the Advent movement raised the level of spirituality for some. But at last he died in battle. Why? Because he did not heed the warnings given. Hmm. Who will charge God with denying his word? Ellen White, conditional prophecy. To turn back with his army would have been humiliating, so he went on. And he got killed. And the prophet Jeremiah lamented Josiah. And all the singing men and the singing women spoke of Josiah and their lamentations to this day. And made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, they are written in the lamentations. So this young king and he came and took everything that was wrong and that was evil. And he chucked it out of the church. And the very next generation puts it all back in again. Oh, there's a lesson in that too. Then comes his son. I'm dealing with the last kings just before the fall of Babylon. In his days, Second King 24.1, this is Joachim. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Joachim became his servant three years. So now we have a lackey king. One that is subject to Babylon. Couldn't happen to us. Huh? No, no, don't think so. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent him bands of Chaldees and bands of Syrians and bands of Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by his servants the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came upon Judah to remove out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had did. Manasseh had done everything right again, removed everything that he had done wrong, but hardly was he gone when he was back. And then early in the reign of Joachim, Nebuchadnezzar, now be careful, came for the first time, first siege, and besieged and captured Jerusalem, and he carried away Daniel and his companions, and others specially chosen for service in the courts of Babylon. So off they go. So Nebuchadnezzar had a first siege of Jerusalem, and he carries away Daniel and his friends. Hmm. But those who had learned to place their trust in the promises of God found these all sufficient in every experience through which they were called to pass during their sojourn in a strange land. The scriptures proved to them a guide and a stay. As an interpreter of the meaning of the judgments beginning to fall upon Judah, Jeremiah stood nobly in defense of the justice of God. Here was a, a prophet, and if you study Jeremiah, it was the three angels' messages. He was a herald like the three angels' messages are today. And he wasn't too well received, as you will know. Untiring the prophet labored, desirous of reaching all classes, he extended the sphere of his influence beyond Jerusalem. Universal message. Various parts of the kingdoms. And he's, uh, <laughs> it's so cute, testimonies to the church. Is this interesting? I like it. Jeremiah constantly referred to the teachings of the book of the law that had been so greatly honored and exalted during Josiah's reign. He emphasized the new the importance of maintaining a covenant relationship with the all merciful and compassionate being who upon the heights of Sinai had been spoken the Decalogues. Here's the message. And Babylon is about to crush Jerusalem. First siege. Daniel and his friends are taken. Jeremiah's words of warning and entreaty reached every part of the kingdom and all had opportunity to know the will of God concerning the nation. The prophet made plain the fact that our Heavenly Father allows his judgments to fall. Nations may know themselves to be but men. 
If you walk contrary to me and will not hearken, the Lord has forewarned his people, I, even I, will scatter you in the whole story. He reminds them. And then finally, Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not heard my words, I will send and take all the families of the north, said the Lord, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them. Make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. <laughs> I will take away the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom. Church will cease. Poof, gone. Destroyed. And the whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So they're taken captive. Well, the next king, Joachim. He slept with his fathers, Joachim, and then his son, Joachim, reigned in his stead. And the king of Egypt came not again anymore out of his land. He was subdued by Babylon. The king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt even unto the river of Euphrates all that pertained to the king of Egypt. Egypt is quiet. And this new king was 18 years old when he began to reign and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Neushta, the daughter of Sansa. And he was evil. So here towards the end, things are very bumpy. Very bumpy in the sight of the Lord according to that which his father had done. And at that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city and they besieged it and off they took these people. <laughs> Carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord. So he fulfilled the prophecy that had been given to Hezekiah. He carried away all Jerusalem, all the princes, all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen, and off they go. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, his father's brother, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. So he was another lackey king, serving under Babylon. These are interesting typologies. And then Zedekiah, who was the brother of the king had been Joachim that had been deposed. He rebelled. He rebelled against the king of Babylon. Of course, he rebelled against God too. Now he thought he could rebel against the king of Babylon, so he gets bonked on the bean. Moreover, all the chiefs of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen. Is there a parallel? Polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem, and the Lord God of his father sent to them by his messenger, rising up at times, sending because he had compassion on his people. They mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, misused his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose upon them. They don't listen. They call these people fanatics, and I don't know what all. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, and he slew the young men. That's the history. Now let's go to the second siege. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his hosts against Jerusalem, and pitched against it, and they built forts against it and around it, and they destroyed it. They flattened it. So there were two main sieges. The first one, captives. Second one, destruction. Between the first and the second, all this apostasy hmm, going on in the church. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. This time it was over. And in the fifth month and the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and he burnt the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, and every great man's house burnt he with fire. All right. That's one typology. 
How many sieges? Two. Two. Let's go to the destruction of Jerusalem, 70 AD. Another nation ruling, Rome. Okay. Not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Christ had given his disciples warning and all who believed his words watched for the promised sign when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, says Jesus. Then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst depart out of thee after the Romans. Under Cestius had surrounded the city. They unexpectedly abandoned the siege. Then when everything seemed favorable for an immediate attack. So here comes the Roman army with Cestius, the general, surrounds it. And then for some unknown reason he receives an SMS or a text message which says whatever it says and off he goes. And the Jews think this is great and they go after him and they give him a hiding and they give him a couple of smacks and the Christians see it as their great opportunity and they flee because that's what Jesus said. And Jesus had said, when you see the Obama nation <laughs> that causes desolation as written by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Something like that, isn't it so? <laughs> Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. Because the Jews were chasing the Romans. And here the Christians went. Upon the retreat of Cestius, the Jews sallying from Jerusalem pursued after his retiring army and both forces were thus fully engaged. The Christians had opportunity to flee. So there's confusion there. At this time, the country also had been cleared of enemies who might have endeavored to intercept them. And they fled to Pella. So the Jewish forces pursuing after Cestius and his army fell upon the rear with such fierceness as to threaten them with total destruction and the Romans were furious. They'd been given a bloody nose by the Jews. Interesting type. And terrible were the calamities that fell upon Jerusalem when the siege was resumed by Titus. Interesting, between the two sieges, Three and a half years. How many sieges? Two. In the first one of Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't destroy the city. He took captives and off he went. Here in the first one, they didn't destroy the city. Off they went. In the second one, total destruction. The horror of starvation. A measure of what wheat was sold for a talent. So fierce were the pangs of hunger that men would gnaw at the leather of their belts and sandals and the coverings of their shields. They would, some would steal out at night. They would be cruelly tortured, crucified. It was mayhem. People died like flies. Thousands perished from famine and pestilence. Natural affections seemed to have been destroyed. Husbands robbed their wives, wives their husbands. Children could be seen snatching food from mouths of aged parents. The question of the prophet, can a woman forget her sucking child, received the answer within the walls of that doomed city. So it was a very sad time. Tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for her delicateness and tenderness. Her eyes shall be evil towards the husband of her bosom and towards her son and towards her daughter and towards her children, which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege. All these things happen right there. This is a fascinating quote in Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History. Now, he's a great historian from that time just thereafter, and he says, I like this, then the spiritual seed of Abraham, which is Christianity, fled to Pella 
on the other side of the Jordan where they found a safe place of refuge and could serve their master and keep his Sabbath. And what's interesting is that archaeology confirms that at Pella the Sabbath was kept for four centuries after Christ. Pella. That's what's left of it. And this is where they fled to and this is where they found a safe haven. So archaeology has revealed that the Sabbath was kept there in Pella. When ye therefore shall see the... Well, let's read it right, okay? <laughs> Abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. That's the King James Version. If you have a red letter version of the King James Version, you will find that all of that is written in red, which says, who said it? Jesus. If you have a red letter version of the NIV, you will find that this portion, Daniel the prophet said it, is not written in red, which means it has been added afterwards and not said by Jesus. Fascinating, isn't it? And then we're told it doesn't matter which version we read. But I guess the scribes should know best, so we must relinquish our ideas. <laughs> so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, NIV. Well, that would be not in red. We should have color-coded this, but I didn't pick it up. Okay. Forgive me, the NIV doesn't have that in red letters. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So you have these two parallel texts. And this holy place that was to be taken up by the army is probably the area that Nehemiah had cleared where the foreign nations were not allowed to congregate on a Sabbath day because they tended to want to do business, right? So he cleared them out. And so around the city was this cleared area, which actually had a Sabbath connotation. And here comes this army and stands in this place. So antitypically, it's taking a stand on Sabbath ground. Interesting. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in the desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for the flight of the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. Out. How many sieges? Two. Between the first and the second siege? Get out. The prophets to whom these great scenes were revealed longed to understand the import they inquired and searched diligently, diligently searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ was pointing to. To us who are standing on the very verge of their fulfillment of what deep moment, what living interest are these delineations of the things to come. So we have to study the parallels. We have to look at the typology. So when the Romans laid siege on the city, they set up a standard, their banners, upon which were depicted their pagan gods. Their standards were planted in the area around the city walls known as holy ground. So it wasn't in the temple, the holy place, but this area cleansed. Not to be confused with the holy place in the temple. Hence this is the same event as that found in the book of Matthew. And Mrs. Wright wrote a statement that suggests that the modern-day fulfillment of this prophecy has already taken place. In 1897, she wrote this. She said, The Protestant world have set up an idle Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be, and they are treading in the footsteps of the papacy. And for this reason, I see the necessity of the people of God moving out of the cities into retired country places, written in 1897. 
first siege, second siege. Then when was the first siege? So it will begin again. But it is over the seventh day Sabbath that the battle will be fought. The authorities of this world will rise up in their pride and power to make laws to restrict religious liberty. They will assume a right that belongs to God alone, like Nebuchadnezzar. There's your parallel, type, anti-type. Even now they are making a beginning. And this they will carry forward till they reach the boundary over which they cannot step. Remember two sieges? The pressure for Sunday law, what's it say there? Has come and is coming. We can see that that which you have been talking about the last 35 years, the law causing the Sunday to be exalted, making human inventions take the place, is now being fulfilled. The decree enforcing the worship of this day has already gone forth. So there was already a first siege. When was that first siege? The time has come, 1903. When as God opens the way, families should move out of the cities. That doesn't mean we must, you know, just pick up and rush relentlessly. As who opens the way? As God opens the way. We must show the world that we recognize in the events that are now taking place in connection with a national reform movement, the fulfillment of prophecy. When was that? Together with 1888, the Sunday law, all of those things. We read it just now. The Blair Bill. So the armies of antitypical spiritual Rome surrounded Jerusalem and wanted to crush them and Adventists were taken captive, put in chain gangs, etc., etc. That was the first siege. And then some great... Adventist speakers like Jones, not Jones and Wagner, the other one, came and gave speeches in that legislature that the blood started running from the nose of those who wanted to bring about those laws. Hmm. Fulfillment of prophecy. That which we have for the last 30, 40 years proclaimed would come is now here. Many who have had to labor earnestly to help open the way will have to have see these things. Let all things be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14.40 14, As I said, as God opens the way, no fanatical movements, nothing like that. Said the messenger of God, shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them. To warn them of what is coming upon the earth. Manuscript release, volume 253. Ere long there will be such strife and confusion in the cities that those who wish to leave them will not be able. We must be preparing for these issues. This is the light that is given me. Isaiah 54 verse 4. Fear not, thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be confounded. You shall not be put to shame, for you shall forget the shame of thy youth, and you shall remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. Fear not, my servant Jacob, be not dismayed. There are all these promises. God will take care of it. God will take care of it. So in 1888, the world was ready for the second coming. The armies of Rome surrounded Jerusalem, and they set up their pagan stamp and standard in Sabbath ground. And they asked for a Sunday law. First siege. Lord's Day Alliance, we've spoken it about already. The Lord's Day Alliance was founded in 1888. I don't have to go into the detail. It's in the previous lecture already. On 1888, first siege. It exists to encourage Christians to reclaim the Sabbath. We know about that. In 2001, they handed out this newsletter after the September 11 event. We are keenly aware that we could not do our work without the financial support of our friends like you. And then it says, In many ways, 2001 has been a watershed year for the ministry of the Lord's Day Alliance. 
At the same time, the national tragedy that occurred on September 11th in New York, Washington and Pennsylvania has changed our perspectives and frankly has caused even those who lack a spiritual thermometer to consider their faith, many for the first time in their life. And then they say, this is the chairperson speaking, we stand on the verge of an unprecedented opportunity to proclaim the message of the Christian Sunday in a manner unseen, at least in my lifetime. And I like the footnote, always giving the address and saying, serving the churches and the nations since 1888. <laughs> Isn't that cute? So we have a first siege in 1888. God's people should be heeding what the prophets have said. And there will be a second siege. Do you hear the rumbling of the wheels of the Roman army under Titus approaching for the second time? I hear the rumbling. It is this great truth that old and young need to learn. We need to study the workings out of God's purpose in the history of nations and the revelation of things to come that we may estimate at their true value things seen and things unseen. The day is at hand. For the lessons to be learned, the work to be done, the transformation of character. What is this series all about? This is not a church bashing series. I know somebody will accuse it as such. It's not. It's a unifying series. The time remaining is but too brief a span. You know, people say you're an alarmist when you preach this kind of thing and you're this and you're that. Are they deaf? Can't they hear the rumbling of the Roman army? Do they watch the news? Behold, they of the house of Israel say the vision that he seeth is for many days to come. You're an alarmist, a conspiracist, or this or that, or whatever. I wrote to one brother who wrote a long article in one of our prominent magazines. I didn't even want it to get out. I sent it to a brother just to see, is it, what I'm saying, is it too hard? And somehow it leaked. <laughs> and now you can find it on Facebook. Everybody knows. And they can read exactly what that altercation was. But fascinating things, you know. You're an alarmist, you're a conspiracist. Is it conspiracy to put prophetic events into the context of the time that we are living in? I don't think so. Therefore say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done. Thus says the Lord. Ezekiel 12. And remember, this prophet was a prophet of the exiles. He was taken captive by the king of Babylon. He knows what he's talking about. The time is not far distant when laws against Sunday labor will be more stringent and an effort should be made to secure grounds away from the cities where fruits and vegetables can be raised. I've done that. But please, I haven't done it to go and hide from the king of Babylon. I'm here in Vancouver right now. Is that correct? So I'm certainly not doing this to run away. I'm just doing it because God said so. That's it. And because he opened the way for me to do it. So don't run ahead of him. Agriculture will open resources for self-support and various other trades also could be learned. This real earnest work calls for strength of intellect as well as of muscle, methods and tact are required even to raise fruits and vegetables successfully. Nature... And everything out there is arrayed against us. Believe you me. Habits of industry will be found an important aid to the youth. There will be in different lands a simultaneous movement for the destruction of God's people. It's not going to be just in the United States or here. It's going to be universal. It's going to happen everywhere. They will come, they will jeer, and they will throng around the God's people. But God will take care of it. 
So a second siege is coming. The first one was defeated in 1888 and Cestus went off with his army and Titus is on his way. Brussels, Belgium, February 16, 2009. The Secretariat of the Commission of the Bishops' Conference of the European Community has welcomed the proposed EU law that would safeguard Sunday as a day of rest from the work, according to Le Osservatore Romano, which is the official paper of the Vatican. So they proposed this law, they put it before the Assembly, and the European Parliament threw it out. 2009. The reason being, there is no evidence that keeping Sunday has any special benefit over any other day. What difference does it make if you rest on a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, whatever? There's no evidence. <laughs> they didn't leave it there. They didn't leave it there. So the church tried to bring it in, and the church was defeated. Now it gets interesting. Court rules German shops must close on Sunday. That was in December 23, 2009. So one nation, the mightiest nation in Europe, goes it unilaterally and the European court decide, the German court decides all shops closed. They bring in their own Sunday law. Now, there is no Sunday law in the sense that uh, you're not allowed to do anything. But my Adventist friends tell me that if they're working on their roof, it could happen uh, that you get called down by the policeman and you get a spot fine of 250 euro for working on the Sunday. So December 2009, just previously, the European court had said, no, no, we're not too interested in that legislation. Germany, the mightiest nation, says, we are, we'll make a law and we'll apply it to the shops. So it overturned a 2006 ru ruling that allowed Berlin's shops to open for 10 Sundays per week, defaulting to stricter standards on weekend store openings. And then, 12-2-2009, world from Berlin, even atheists need to switch off on Sundays, says Spiegel Online, that's like Time magazine. Germany's High Court has ruled that Sunday should be kept as a day of rest and has overturned the Berlin law easing restrictions on Sunday shopping. Now listen to this, this gets interesting. Most German newspapers on Wednesday, greet the ruling. People always told me it will never happen. It's a secular nation. They're not interested. It's not going to happen. You're, you're cuckoo. But now, most newspapers greet the ruling. Some for regions of religion and tradition. Others out of a concern for workers' rights. I love it. Ah, I rejoice. The mark of the beast will be implemented where? On the hand or the forehead? Those who receive it in the forehead are intellectually convinced that this is the right day of worship. Those who welcome it in order to safeguard laborers' rights, the worker, receive it where? On the hand. Most papers welcomed it. Some because they want the mark of the beast in their forehead. And some because they want the mark of the beast in their hand. Does that make sense? All right. What's the date? December 2009. Then, labor unions joined the churches in their campaign to ring fence Sunday as a day off for the nation. The Spirit of Prophecy says, the trade unions will be one of the means to bring about a time of trouble such as never was. And the leadership called me in. And they said to me, you will not say that the trade unions will bring about a time of trouble. We have very good relations with the trade unions. 
I said, but here it says in the spirit of prophecy that if you don't sever your relations, you will not receive the seal of God. This is an important issue. You will not say that. I said, but here it says that I have to say it. You will not say that. Then they made a compromise. You will not say it in In (laughs) Jew. And I said, well, okay, I'll make that compromise. One condition. The blood is on your head. They got up, went and stood in a corner, negotiated, came back, said okay. Can you believe that? I've had amazing experiences. Don't even know if I should tell these things. And I'm not saying it to knock my church or to run it down. I'm just saying these are the realities. The spirit of prophecy is spot on. The very next week there were riots in Germany and the trade unions knocked everything apart. I was so grateful to the trade unions. All right, so they were broadly in favor of the ruling. Now it gets very interesting. Can you hear the rumbling of the Roman army approaching for the second time? I know it has to come from the United States, but this is now Europe in various places simultaneously. Did they say that? Okay. Then, 18th of January 2010. These these are very close together. Krisengipfel im Kanzleramt, das Sonntagsgegacker. There's an economic crisis in Europe and they're trying to settle it and the three leading parliamentarians in Germany, which is the Chancellor Merkel and her uh, two senior cabinet ministers, are discussing how to get rid of this crisis and they're so busy they happen to get together on a Sunday to try and prepare the paperwork for the discussion on the Monday. Ooh, naughty, naughty. That's what my parrot says. Shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do that. So they get reprimanded. And who do they get reprimanded by? By an interesting bishop by the name of Reinhard Marx. And he says, Politiker sollen ein Zeichen setzen und sonntags keine Arbeitssitzungen abhalten, forderte der Oberhirtete grollend die Sonntagsruhe ein. Now what does that mean? It means politicians must set a sign. And they mustn't have meetings on Sundays. So the chief shepherd angrily asks for Sunday rest. German Chancellor reprimanded publicly in the public newspapers of Germany for daring to work on a Sunday. Is this interesting? Do you hear the rumbling? Bild, there it is again. Erzbischof kritisiert Sonntagsarbeit. He criticizes us. Now, who is this? Who is this fellow? Well, I have such a nice picture of him, I couldn't resist it. There he is. That's Reinhard Marx. Now, who is he? He's the successor to Pope Benedict's former bishop position. So it's not just anyone. He's strong enough to step into the shoes of Benedict. He's not just anyone. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. And, no, I think I should leave that text out. What do you think? <laughs> Let's not go that route. <laughs> Remember in February 2009 that everybody was happy that they asked for Sunday law, the churches, and they rejected it. Church of England, House of Bishops, European Panel, Secretary, Commission for Catholics, Bishop, all of these welcomed the initiative for several members of the European Parliament to ask the House to decide on a written declaration. Parliament threw it out. Germany went it alone. And the reasons why, having regard to articles so-and-so, so-and-so, the Eurofund survey shows that the likelihood of sickness and absenteeism in establishing that work on Saturday and Sunday is 1.3 times greater compared with the establishment 
that do not require staff to work at the weekend. So they're starting to bring statistics to say why we need this day off. Doesn't work because, you know, you can have a Wednesday off, a Thursday off, or a Friday off. According to EU law, Sunday is the weekly rest day for children and adolescents. Ooh, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting clever. <laughs> now we're getting clever. Whereas the European institutions, and bodies and agencies have not worked on Sunday since their creation and do not intend to do so in the future, despite the diversity of religious cultures, etc., 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 etc. Reconciliation of work and family life. This is brilliant. So now they're coming back, but they're not alone now. It's not the churches. This is now 2010. It's just the next year. The chancellor has just been rebuked. They call an article so and so, an article so and so, and no, 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 and the majority, way, way, da, 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 and all of these things. And the next moment, all of these church organizations join together. And bring about an article, why Sunday should be included as a weekly rest day in the revised working time directives. And uh, it's about family life. Family life. You see, in Europe, kids go to school six days a week. Sunday is their only day off. What a brilliant argument. So Parliament... You said it doesn't matter whether you rest on a Wednesday, a Thursday, or a Sunday. You are disruptors of the family. You are responsible for the destruction of the family. Because if the father and the mother work, the children are at home alone. Could make a movie like that, eh? Hmm. And if one of the parents work, you've also disrupted the family. So the only logical day for a day of rest is which day? That's a good argument. You think they're going to win? Yep, they're going to win. So more than any other day of the week, a free Sunday offers the opportunity to meet friends to establish and maintain social ties. More than any other day of the week, a free Sunday offers workers the opportunity to pursue their spiritual needs. According to Eurofund, the likelihood of sickness is 1.3 times greater. Okay, if you don't have a rest day. And then, of course... An example of how the EU can make a tangible contribution to the quality of life of its citizens. So now it's not just a religious issue, it's a working issue. And then, boom, 24th of March, 2010, they hand it in for the second time and say, European Parliament, think again. You threw it out in 2009, here it is in 2000. Do you hear the rumbling? Wow, a conference to relaunch the debate on Sunday protection at the European level. And it was handed in, and here they are. Parliamentarians, church members, all of them together. And they start the posters. Protection of a work-free Sunday. European Parliament, keynote speakers. And he's one of the parliamentarians. But what's on the picture? The kiddies. They're clever. They're clever. And who's behind it now? Just the churches? No. These church organizations, these civil societies, and all of these trade unions. So now you have the trade unions asking for Sunday law. You have the civil societies and the organizations and the family organizations asking for Sunday law. You have the churches asking for Sunday law. The parliament backs off and says, uh, we need a million signatures from the public. So they start a web page. And they say, please sign. Please sign. All of these organizations. European initiate campaign for work-free Sunday. One million citizens needed to request day for whom? The children. Strasbourg, March 17, 2010. Martin Kassler, German member of the European Parliament, launches the first citizen referendum of the European Union to request that Sunday be declared a day for family and rest. Do you hear the rumbling of the Roman army returning for the second time? The next thing is destruction. We're at the end 
Over 11,375 Europeans at various countries have already signed. This was a long time ago that I looked at the webpage. I'm sure those millions are in. You can go to that webpage. You can check it out. Thanks to the Lisbon Treaty and the introduction of the European Citizens Initiative, we as European citizens for the first time get the opportunity to stand up for our concerns. We want to use this opportunity to ensure a free Sunday. How we were mocked, it'll never happen. Hello? Watch the prophecies. The initiative allows citizens to appeal to the European Commission on a topic of interest. Just one million signatures. Trade unions, civil societies, all the churches. Get involved! The deputy invited all who were convinced that the Free Sunday and Direct Democratic Matter to show their support. He encouraged citizens to get involved in the democratic process. That's 2010. By the way, what year are we in now? I think those wheels could run over my foot. You agree? Kassler affirmed the Work Free Sunday is part of our European culture. We need time for our families. Relations for the civil society, religion, the full life of working days is unlikely to perform. Europe should be the most child-friendly region. Oh, they're on a good wicket here. They can't lose. Imagine if you oppose it. What are you against? You're against the children. You're against family values. You're against everything that's decent and proper. You'll be a real pain in the neck. Rallying together. Come together, let's do this thing. The petition points out that the Work Free Sunday is needed in Europe for the children who need a family day. Please. Every person needs spare time to relax for your hobbies, for religion. See, it's always secular and religious. Hand and forehead, hand and forehead, hand and... Oh, the Bible is fantastic. It's a central pillar of the European social model. It's a cultural heritage. By the way, there's the webpage you can go to, www.freesunday.eu, Europe. And look at this cute poster. Sonntags gehören Mami und Papi uns. Let's translate that. Sundays, Daddy and Mommy belong to us. Sunday is Children's Day. They belong to us. Not a day like any other. It's Sunday. This is 2010. Brothers and sisters, we're going home. And I don't want to be an alarmist, but this is it. Pfarrer Dr. Jürgen Henkel. And then he mentions all these churches and all these guys coming together. And there you can pick it up on this, in, this official website to get the signatures. The evangelicals, the uh, Protestants in the church, the European Christians, 75% want it. Da, 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 the whole bit is there. We don't have to go into all, all of this. It's the first public-driven initiative to bring about Sunday. Enforcing Sunday observance and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh day Sabbath, the law of God, will to all intents and purposes be made void. It cannot happen, the people said, even in my church. The prophet said so. It will happen. Wake up! To secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for Sunday laws. Have they resisted it so far? Yes. Will they yield? Yes, the pressure is mounting. One of those trade unions is so mighty. What about all of them together? In my country we just had riots and Terrible strikes. You must have seen it on the news maybe even. Everything was shut down for salary increases. You have the right to strike. Do you have the right not to strike? Doesn't look like it. And what did they do? They went in and they stopped everyone from working. Even the hospitals. And those little intensive care hospitals where all those incubators are with those little children... 
They chased those nurses out there and 50 little babies died in one area alone. Is that murder or is it not? That's murder. Are they one of the means to bring about a time of trouble such as never was? Was there any case, any investigation of the issue? No. No, you can get away with that. These people are strong. They will enforce what they want. The parliamentarian there is Thomas Munn. And he's working with a broad initiative to combine the church there with the uh, European Union. And he's the spokesman at the parliament level. And Radio Vatican says, this is marvelous. This is our man. And then it tells here about what he does and how he promotes Sunday and how many organizations are on his side. 72 organizations and parliamentarians and all of these are on my side. We're going through with this thing. And then the BBC holds an interview. I'm just going to play a short piece of this interview. It's just interesting. This is the very first piece. It's a long interview. But just listen to what the BBC has to say. That's probably the most secular country on the planet where Christianity, in my opinion, is dead and spiritism reigns. What a barometer. Let's listen. Mondays used to be a very different day to uh, the rest of the week. One day we could all relax, we could see friends and family, we could go to church. It's all changed. Should the Sabbath be a day of rest? We, I mean, Christina, we've, we've gone beyond the point of, uh, of return on this, haven't we? I mean, you know, here you are, you've got a deadline for tomorrow, you've got to write an article, you've got to appear on a wonderful television program on a Sunday morning. It's just, it's not the way we live now, is it? No, but wouldn't it be nice if the government sent us a message that they didn't think of us only as units of consumption and, bees. and production and worker bees. Yeah. Just once in a week, we were let off the hook and we could not shop and we could not work and, uh, and actually concentrate on, on the other, on the whole self. On each other. And on each other. Why not? I'm going to stop the rest of the debate. Wouldn't it be nice if who? Government could send us a message that for one day of the week we don't have to shop, don't have to work. Do you hear the rumbling? Blair courts controversial U.S. pastor Rick Warren, the darling of the Christian world, in a bid to unite faiths. So the politicians are working with the church. What do you want? What is it that you all want? Pope calls for a new world order. July 9, 2009. Has proposed a new world political authority with real teeth. Let's go for it. Close the gap. Together with Japan's Prime Minister. May 25, 2010, Obama to seek a new international order. President Obama is fighting criticism for his declaration of the weekend that he would seek a new international order. Because this raises questions on sovereignty. President Obama addresses the graduates of the U.S. Military Academy and there he asks for a new world order. Who can make war against him? Who can make war? Why use the military? Huh? He will force everyone, great and small. The president added that efforts by American armed forces need to be complemented with greater diplomatic engagement from grand capitals of dangerous outposts, etc. Uh, these people, are they subject to Rome? Yes or no? Or is this a conspiracy? <laughs> Look at that. Fascinating. That must be the happiest man in the world. He's the spiritual leader of the military might of the United States of America, officially, because the grand knight of Malta from America is the one who controls that. And that's why all candidates have to come and be seen with him 
and why they love the Templars and why they shake hands with these people. And it's no coincidence. I don't believe it's a coincidence. It's not written by him, but he allowed it on his webpage. You know these things. There's been a lot of changes in the past hundred years. Not only have we seen gang activity increase along with crimes, but so has energy consumption and other change. I realize that the rescinding of the Sunday laws across the United States on his official webpage, it's just, it's like a subliminal little message. So perhaps we should consider enacting a Sunday law not to restrict people from working, but to give liberty to those who can't choose. Permitted on his official webpage. He asks for an international order. Pope calls for solidarity in the world's finances, says ethics must guide all action. May 22 has called for ethics and solidarity in the world's financial system. So labor must be ruled by ethics. Trade unions asking for Sunday, yes or no? Okay. Hmm. Popey, what are you doing? I think his fingers have a twitch, don't you? On the same day that President Obama calls for a new international order to solve the challenges of our times, Pope Benedict calls for an international cooperation. Are they working in concert? Do you think there was a telephone conversation before they made the announcements on the same day? The one to the military and the other one to that? And then, 26-9, 2010, Pontiff once families to start preparing for 2012. Families? Was families an issue anywhere? <laughs> Did you hear anything about families? Okay, what does he want for the families? The next world meeting of families is not till 2012, but Benedict is asking families and parish parishes to begin preparations a year in advance. A veiling of Pope John Paul II's apostolic exhortation on the family. Oh, the family. <laughs> he made his request in August 23, letter to the President of the Pontifical Council. The theme for the upcoming Seventh World Meeting of Families is family, work, and celebration. The Holy Father's letter reflected on these themes and the appropriate balance of work and rest Work and celebration are intimately connected in the life of families. They need choices, influence relations between married couples and between parents and children affect the relations of families with society and with the church. And the pamphlet noted, Holy Scripture tells us that the family work and feast days are a gift and a blessing of God to help us to live a full human existence. What is he asking for? He's asking for Sunday legislation. And he's saying make 2011 preparatory for that. And now he's asked to speak before the German parliament next year. Something which had been resisted as a foreign power to address <laughs> that nation would seem like they were subject to him. But now they are considering it. So watch the press for details. And then the Pope went on and he said it is necessary to promote reflection and effort at reconciling the demands and the periods of work with those of the family and to recover the true meaning of the feast, especially on Sunday. The weekly Easter, the day of the Lord and the day of man, the day of the family, of the community and of solidarity. Get ready for 2012. I'm not date setting, but I'm saying I hear the rumbling of the Roman army coming to besiege Jerusalem for the second time and then it will be over. Then it will be over. It is my wish therefore that already in the course of 2011 the 30th anniversary of the apostolic exhortation by his predecessor on the family the great charter of family pastoral care might be taken as a valid guide with initiatives at the parish, etc., etc. Let's move it. 
I want it, and I want it now. I want a new international order. I want a new world order. I want Sunday legislation, and I want the mark of the beast implemented, and I don't care if it's on your hand or on your forehead, but I want it, and I want it now. Is he saying that, yes or no? We've been preaching this for years, and now it's here. I hear the rumbling of the Roman army. Ezekiel says, I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the eyes and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is come and it is done, says the Lord. This is the day whereof I have spoken. We are here. My beloved church, wake up. Stop playing your ecumenical tunes. Come home. It's no good negotiating with the kings of Babylon. It's no good showing them your treasures and thinking he will protect you. He'll wipe you out. That's what the type says. That's what the anti-type will confirm. And he said unto me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So brothers and sisters, just a little lecture to say where we are in the stream of time, where we fit in typologically, and for those that were hoping that they can run when the siege comes, too late. No escape at the second siege. Now's the time to make a decision to follow the Lord. Amen.